fellow friends. I hope this message finds you with peace and health. This week was a challenging one, as I came close to a fatal stroke. As I was lying down on the floor, close to losing consciousness, I kept praying for Jesus Christ, for deliverance and protection, at that trying moment. Despite breathing was becoming heavy and difficult, while praying, I remembered I could choose to believe in the righteousness of God, through Christ. Soon after that, I began to feel my breathing, and heart rate, stabilizing. Afterwards, it was one of those experiences, that allow you to comprehend situations in life, with a renewed perspective. I remembered from the experience, feeling the presence of Jesus Christ, holding my hand. I also recall, having felt the same emotion, when I started to cry out to Jesus, to help me recover from narcissist and SR abuse. This video was what I have learned with this situation, so I choose to share it with you. When I share I am a born again Christian, I am not talking about religion. I am addressing my relationship with Jesus Christ, which is a spiritual path. What I want to share with you, is that we can choose, out of our free will and responsibility, to pursue, and to live, in love of the truth. Love of the truth, bring us in the righteousness of God, through Christ. What does it mean to be the righteousness of God, in Christ Jesus? It simply means that when God looks at us, He sees us through Jesus Christ, and His finished work of the cross. When we place our faith in Christ, God describes the perfect righteousness of Christ to our soul, so that we become able to walk on the love of the truth path and reject lies and deceptions. One of the main forces that keep us in bondage after narcissist and SR abuse is our difficulty detaching ourselves from the lies and deceptions. I could not have gotten rid of them by myself and that is how the miracle of God has manifested in my life. When I had chosen to be baptized as a born-again Christian, I buried the victim from the abuse. What I have observed is that satanic narcissists no longer influence me after that. Their hooks no longer work on me, as I have been actively consciously choosing to believe and to walk in the righteousness of God through Christ. Despite all I have been through, I choose to express love as I walk in the righteousness of God through Christ. I choose to encourage others to recover and heal from their own abuse experiences. I choose to decrease, so that the Holy Spirit in us can increase. Sometimes we cannot receive healing, until we are delivered, and set free, by the love of the truth. The enemy will try to persuade you, to stay focused on his lies and deceptions. However, the truth of the living word of God, can not only free you from the bondage, but also, heal you. Let the transforming power of Jesus Christ, revolutionize your life from the inside out. I hope the following messages, bring you further inspiration and discernment, along your recovery journey. God bless you. Please, remember. Truth, is freedom. But, whether they want to hear it or not, the Lord always sends forth watchmen to warn. He always does. He never does anything till he warns. <clears throat> the gospel of accommodation. Now, to accommodate means to adapt. It means to make suitable or acceptable. It also means to adjust, to make something very convenient. It means to yield to the desires of others to placate them. Now, you put that together, and I'm talking about a gospel that's been invented in hell, it is now being propagated all of the United States. It's a suitable, acceptable, convenient, a gospel that has yielded to the desires and the weakness of sinful men. I call it the gospel of accommodation because it's adapting and adjusting the gospel uh, to appease and attract sinners. This gospel of accommodation is primarily an American cultural invention to ease our lifestyle. It appeals primarily to white America, rich and prosperous. It was invented out of hell itself. This new gospel is sweeping the America and the nation is influencing ministers of every denomination. It's giving birth to mega churches. Some of the largest churches in the United States are involved in this gospel. 
It's a non-confronting, convenient gospel, adapted. It is spoon-fed to the congregation by uh, skits, humorous skits and drama, short, non-abrasive, 20-minute messages, and it's all called seeker-friendly. The seeker-friendly churches. And one of these days, there may be somebody move into the city and try to bring one of these churches right into New York City. They are springing up now overnight, and suddenly thousands attend. This new gospel is being propagated by bright, young, intelligent, ta talented ministers. They, they came upon a formula by which you can go in any city, in any town, and almost overnight build a mega church. And as I understand this formula, you begin by going into the community with your workers and you poll the community to find out what the sinner found offensive about attending church. Well, why don't you attend church? And what was offensive about it? And what would it, what would we have to do to bring you back into the church? What would make you comfortable? What would you like to see? You don't like choirs? We'll do away with choirs. You, you, you don't like suits in church? You come the way you choose? Uh, just tell us what you want. And they survey the community and then sit in their, uh, with their computers and in their conference rooms and they design a program that will make it comfortable for the sinner and make it friendly for, they rather than call it sinner friendly, they would call it seeker friendly and try to attract them to come into the house of God. It's becoming the most prosperous, most flourishing of all religious movements in the history of America. The churches are run like corporations. The pastor is the CEO, chief executive officer. And it's big business. And this formula has now been cleverly packaged. And it is now being pushed in seminars all over the United States. It sounds good. What they say sounds very good. It sounds spiritual in its goals. It sounds like Jesus is the central theme. And folks, I'm not going to name any names because I'm not talking about the character of these men. I'm talking about the gospel that they preach. I am here to remind you that Paul the Apostle warned of the coming of another gospel which we have not preached. He said there is coming another gospel that's going to preach another Jesus. You'll hear his name. It'll sound sweet, but it's not the Jesus that I preach, Paul said. It's not the true Jesus. Paul goes on, or Paul was amazed, he said that you were so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. Folks, listen to me. There is in the land right now, with thousands of people sitting under another gospel, another Jesus, being preached by ministers who have lost the touch of God and been transformed into angels of light, to come and to deceive, if possible, even the elect of God. Paul goes to warn the church, it's really not another gospel, but it's a perversion of the gospel of Christ. Which is really not another, Paul said, but there be some that trouble you and pervert or change the gospel of Christ. He said they're going to change it. They're going to accommodate the sinner. They're going to accommodate their pleasures. They're going to accommodate all of their needs. And they're going to design a gospel with their own Christ, with their own doctrine. Then this awful warning from Paul. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you but that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Folks, I didn't say that. The Apostle Paul said it. If anybody preach another gospel, what you've heard, if anyone preach anything but the crucified Christ, if anyone preach anything that appeases man in his sin, that's not the gospel you heard from me, Paul said, and anyone preaches another, let him be accursed. And he said it's going to be dangerous because it's going to come from seemingly pious, sincere ministers. That's what made the doctrine called antinomianism so dangerous because it was in the hands of some very uh, fine, uh, good living men like Dr. Crisp, who was one of the founders of that anti-law movement back during the Puritan age. Anti-law, they they cast aside the burden of the law and the reason it was so accepted because the men who preached it seemed to be so pious. And I tremble when I hear Paul warn us that Satan's going to come right into the church disguised as an angel of light. He's going to infiltrate into the church with his own ministers, 
They'll come angel, like he said, preaching a false gospel of righteousness. For such are false prophets, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends will be according to their works. Paul said they're going to come and they're going to glory in the flesh. They're going to glory in their might, their money. They're going to glory in their bigness, their numbers. And they're going to glory in the fact that they are so contemporary. They're going to glory in their acceptance by the world. Jesus warned, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They're going to come like gentle sheep, sincere, intelligent, bright. But said inward, they're ravening wolves. And folks, Jesus gave that in the context of his message. He said, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. And the very next verse, he says, beware of false prophets. You're going to come in sheep's clothing, but they're ravening wolves. It's Christ himself warning us. False prophets, false pastors, false evangelists. Posing as, sub as submissive sheep. I'm going to come saying the way is not that narrow. The way is not that straight. And they're going to accommodate. They're going to change the gospel to suit the needs of the people. Jesus puts his finger on the motives behind them. Ambition. The word ravening here. Ravening wolves in the Greek means star for recognition and, recognition and gratification. Men are going to rise, starve to make it. You see it in the business world. You see it on your job. People trying to climb the ladder and get recognition quickly. And folks, it's now in the ministry, full blown. Young men so ambitious to be one of the big boys, to have the biggest church, the biggest numbers, the biggest crowds. He said they're ravening wolves. And Jesus left no doubt about what he meant. And this is simply what he meant. They're going to be struggling pastors in the land. And they're going to look out and see all of the striving and competition for numbers and recognition. And there's going to be a growing, growing pressure to expand and be successful. They see the measuring of success now by how big the buildings are and how many people attend the church on Sunday morning. And this struggling pastor who's been faithful up to now sees struggling young, uh, uh, he sees bright young men come down the street nearby and suddenly overnight he's pastoring thousands of people in a seeker friendly church. A young man less experienced, a young man who's not paid his dues as far as this man is concerned. He's still preaching an old, fa old fashioned faithful gospel of the cross and its claims and he's struggling. Because not many people want to hear the cross. Jesus said, few there are going to be that find it. Wide is the road leading to destruction. Narrow is the way, Jesus said. Straight and narrow. And Jesus is warning. He's saying to the pastor's brother, man of God, watch out. The moment you look out on the competition, the moment that seat gets in your heart, the devil's going to put one of these wolves in sheep's clothing right at your path. He's going to seduce you into an ungodly ambition to compete and to be one of these big boys. And he's going to tempt you for church growth at any cost. And it'll cost the soul of the pastor. I read Paul's warning in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter about ministers being transformed into angels of light who believe they're preaching righteousness, but they've been changed somehow into a tool of Satan. And I say, God, can that be possible? Lord, is that, is that really reasonable that a man who starts right can change and become a tool of the devil in the pulpit? Am I to conclude that a man of God can start right, be a true shepherd for a season, preach a true gospel, but something of hell lays hold of his heart and his spirit, something demonic, and he changes and he becomes a minister of Satan? Folks, it's happening every day. It's happening right here in New York City. 
When men become dissatisfied with preaching a simple gospel, they get bored and not, not praying, and they're not seeking God, and they get their eyes on people and numbers, and, and, and they want to be judged like everybody else. I want to be a success. And so it comes out, and I hear it everywhere I go. I hear a pastor say, I saw it on television, and, uh, watching uh, uh, in the apartment we were renting on a vacation, and it was Sunday morning, and you listen to these pastors. We have 2,500. This year, my goal next year is 4,500. And any cost, any way to reach that goal. Not wrong to pray for growth, but if it's only to feed human ambition, it'll change the man into a devil. Listen, if you find the right formula, it said you can be a success in any field of endeavor possible. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Some young men have come up with the formula how to build a church. A formula. This formula based accommodating gospel is contrary to everything in the scripture. I read in Acts 13 of a gathering of godly men in Antioch. They were out going to send out some young ministers to establish churches and preach the gospel to a darkened world. How does God go about building churches? How does the Holy Ghost work? Scripture said they gathered and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. This was their planning session. Worship, fasting, waiting on the Lord for direction till the Holy Ghost comes and tells them exactly what to do. Number two, they prayed. No strategizing, no networking. No one made a step until the Holy Ghost said, this is the way, walk in it. And then when the Holy Ghost spoke, they laid hands on them and sent them out, the Bible says, under the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You see, Paul had lived his whole religious life under religious formulas. He saw he'd lived with these man-made schemes. He, he had seen teachings that accommodated the weaknesses and the sinfulness of backslidden Jews. He'd had his stomach full of it. He said, I have nothing to do with that. It attracts the multitudes, yes. But he said, one day Jesus came and revealed himself in me. And Paul put all of the formulas aside as dung. As garbage. Paul, by his own confession, said, I'm determined to go forth to fully preach the gospel of Christ in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And unless the gospel is preached in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost, it's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. And sadly, multitudes in America don't even know what the gospel is because they haven't heard it. Paul boasted unashamedly. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Paul said, now, brethren, the, the, the Jews and the Greeks are trying to make us accommodate our message now. The Jews want us to give them signs and the Greeks want wisdom. They want miracles over here and over here they just want ten steps on how to cope. They want wisdom. But Paul said there will be no accommodating. Let them call our preaching foolishness. Let them say it's out of date, that it's not contemporary. He said, I've determined to preach nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This other gospel accommodates the sinner in many ways. But there are three areas of accommodation that the Holy Ghost grieves over. And this, I've felt the grief of God on these three areas of accommodation where people have, where ministers are changing the gospel to suit the crowd. Number one, the accommodation of man's love for pleasure. Know this also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And the Greek word for pleasure here is sensuality, lust, voluptuousness. In other words, exciting, gratifying, sensual pleasures. And all folks, here's the danger. Those who are established these seeker-friendly churches, they, and they're prepared to accommodate the crowd. The Bible says they're going to have to not 
preach, it, it's very, very clear they cannot preach against sensuality because the apostle says they're going to be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They're going to love their sports. They're going to love their X-rated movies. They're going to love their videos. They're going to love their, their uh, computer sex. They're going to love these sensuous things. The Bible says they're going to love these things. They're going to come into the house of God. And if you're going to accommodate them, you're not going to touch one of their lusts. You're not going to say one word about it. They're going to have to be, they're going to have to be prepared to stand in their pulpit and we could sin. Paul said of these men, these resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, counterfeit regarding the faith. Counterfeits. You know, I watched in disbelief at a televised main service of one of these secret funny churches, one of the large sinner, or secret funny churches. And the pastor starts the service saying, we're here to have fun tonight, because tonight is David Letterman night. And the pastor said, brazenly after service, we're here not to offend, but to make it comfortable. How long do you think that crowd would stay in that church and the pastor was shaken by the Holy Ghost, convicted of entertaining people into hell? And he stood up one Sunday night and he said, be sure your sins will find you out. Let me tell you what happened in that church. Those thousands who sit there, those who are hungry for God and didn't know any better, they would weep and break before God in a moment. And everyone else would head for the doors and never come back. Oh, there are going to be pastors on Judgment Day hear these awful words, Son of man, I made thee a watchman. You were to hear the word at my mouth and give them warnings from me. You were to tell the wicked thou shalt surely die. And you gave them no warning, nor spake to warn the wicked from the wicked ways to save their lives. These same wicked men will die. These same wicked men did die in their sins, but now their blood I require from your hands. Accommodation number two. The accommodation of modern man's aversion to self-denial. Number three, the accommodating of men's offense of the cross. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Paul spoke of the offense of the cross. And we're coming now to the heart of why God hates this new doctrine, this new movement in America. This is why God hates it, rejects it outright, and why he's cursed it, and why God will put anathema on any preacher who embraces it. God demands more than coming to the cross. He demands going through the cross. And that's the offense, that it takes everything a man has and owns and trusts in. You see, the offense of the, the, the sinner is most willing to come to the cross and kneel before it. He's willing to take the claims by a single confession of faith and, and just say, yes, Lord, I believe. He wants all of the benefits of the cross. He wants to believe that Christ is sacrificed, yes, and covered all his sins. Now, folks, that's being preached. The cross, though all the phraseology is there, it's sweetly talked about the cross. Come to the cross of Jesus and be forgiven. There's not one word about saying going on with Christ into the tomb and to die. There's not a word about going down into the grave and coming out resurrected in newness of life. It's coming to the cross, kneel, say a prayer, and go back to your sins. Go back and no one say a word. You take it by faith. You are now the righteousness of Christ. No dying to sin, no being resurrected in newness of life. Now that's the offense of the cross. That you go all the way when you come. He demands full obedience. He demands everything we have. And I'm afraid a majority of people who claim to be Christians and saved in these last days have been to the cross, but they've never been through the cross. They've never been buried with Christ. Paul said, I died with Christ. I was raised with Christ. I was crucified with Christ. I not only came to his cross, I picked up my cross, I went through with him.
We have another gospel now that tells men what the cross did for him, but not what it wants to take him to. The gospel, folks, is not just forgiveness. It's not simply believe and get heaven someday. It's not only the saving of the soul, it's the saving of the body. This flesh. God says, I want your flesh. I want your body as a living sacrifice. And that's the preaching of the cross. Folks, I don't care if, they, if somebody could gather a crowd of 100,000 people in a stadium and they could turn to me and say, Pastor Dave, you're wrong. Look, 100,000 people that have come to my secret friendly church and here they are. They're all believers now. But folks, I want you to know something. If those 100,000 people have not been given the full gospel of Jesus Christ, has not been preached fully, if the claims of the cross have not been laid there, and if they've been coddled and comforted in their sins, that 100,000 have been made twice a child of hell than ever before there and worse shape because the Bible says they can come now and hear the words of the curse even and bless himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart and add drunkenness to thirst. Because a false peace has been given to them that they can live in their sins. Never be rebuked. Never be reproved. Never see the claims of the cross. That he not only died to deliver man from, from the thought of sin and the idea of sin, but the dominion of sin in his own life. If the preaching of grace doesn't have as its goal righteousness, it's another gospel. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I, I, I saw a televised interview of, of people that had joined one of America's most renowned seeker-friendly churches. And this man testified words... I, I'm as close, I believe, as the way I heard it. He said, I come here because I'm never made to feel uncomfortable about my life. I can bring my Jewish friends, my business associates. They'd never be embarrassed. I don't have to be a fanatic. And the preaching and the skits are really enjoyable and uplifting. And best of all, church only lasts one hour. Contrast that with Paul's preaching. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Behold this self same thing that you sorrowed after godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. Indignation, fear. Yea, what vehement desire and zeal. What revenge. In all things you approved yourself to be clear in this matter. And Paul warns if there's not that kind of preaching, many will walk of whom I told you often and now tell you even weeping. They are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. I came to New York City when AIDS was plaguing Broadway. People were dying left and right. Black Muslims in Times Square spewing out hate. Young blacks and young Puerto Ricans feeling the world has left them behind and angry. Intellectuals cursing Christ, liberal minds who say there's no hope, and you tell me I'm going to come in with a 15 minute skit, and I'm going to have a cute little worship team giving little ditty bot songs to a dying world. God, help our blindness. Folks, we started down on Crack Alley on 41st Street in that ragtag theater. And from the first time I stood in the pulpit, I preached repentance. I preached the cross. I said, I'm not, we are not here to comfort you in your sins. We're here to confront you in your sins and to believe that there's a Savior who'll deliver you. And they, the experts tell us that won't work. People don't want that. 
I talked to a man the other day, just, he was visiting one of these churches, and they decided they're going to break their church up in little groups with, with prayer meetings. And he went to one of the prayer meetings. And this is a seeker-friendly type church. And you know what the prayer meeting consisted of? Hot chocolate and donuts. And then they brought all the games out, the board games, and played games the rest of the evening. And there are those people that are dying in their sins, and they're playing Ouija boards and all of this garbage. Do you think for one moment that we would ever stand for the Carter, myself, or any of our men, any of our teachers would stand in this pulpit where drug crazed people come to visit, people half dead, people crying and yearning for just one word of hope? Do you think for one minute I'm going to give a 20-minute sermonette to ease their mind? No. I am so glad he laid hold of my heart one day. I'm so glad he revealed his heart to me. And I can say with Paul the Apostle, he revealed his, he, Christ revealed himself in me, not to me, but in me. Hallelujah. And as, as long, I know as long as this man is in this church, as long as I'm in this pulpit, there will never, ever be from this pulpit an accommodating gospel. Ever an accommodating gospel. If you'll turn with me, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. Isaiah Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, then Daniel. Chapter 1. My message this morning, may God give us light. We've been fasting, we've been praying as a church. We fasted and prayed for three days this week. We met nightly to pray, asking the Lord God to keep the light burning in this church. Give us a testimony that cannot be denied. Help us, God Almighty, to win many to the saving knowledge of Christ in our generation. Thank God for that. <clears throat> my voice is a little raspy this morning. That's because I preached and prayed and sang my heart out all week this week. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're going to lose your voice, you might as well lose it doing that, I tell you. Thank God. Thank God. <clears throat> May God give us light. Father, I thank you with all my heart, Lord, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, God for the strength that you are willing to give to those of us who want to honor your name. God, you will take us, you're, if we're willing, you'll take us, Lord, to places of strength that are not possible to even the strongest physically among us. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you, God, to give me the anointing I need to speak this word today and give each of us the hearts that we need to be able to hear it. We stand against every weapon of hell that would ever try to steal this word from any heart this morning. We thank you for the victory that is ours in Christ. Thank you. Override the frailty of this human vessel and God speak to our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. God, may God give me light. Daniel chapter one, just one verse, verse eight. <clears throat> but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now Daniel was a young man who lived through, he lived most of his life through a very dark season for the people of God. People of God that had been once appointed by God to be a blessing and a testimony of God's goodness through the earth. They were the extension of that promise that was made to Abraham. I'm going to bless you, I'm going to multiply you, and through you and through your descendants, the blessing of God will be known in the earth. Now this was the portion of the people of Israel at this time, yet they did as many generations have done, churches can do it, who've once known the light and the life of God. They began to deal very casually with the things of God not realizing that we are in a war for the honor of God and for the souls of men. And when we start to deal casually with the things of God, whether it's corporately as a nation, whether it's collectively as a church or individually, 
We forget there's an enemy at the gate always waiting to take us captive. And an enemy whose sole purpose in this earth from the days of Eden is to swallow the testimony of God. Even the book of Revelation talks about the serpent sending a flood out of his mouth to swallow this testimony that God had established through his people Israel. He was living in the midst of his own people. His people were surrounded and largely dominated by the influence of an ungodly society. But in spite of it, Daniel was given an excellent spirit. And rightly he could have, I can just imagine how many people were compromising. How many groups were compromising? How many individuals were saying, well, this is just the new reality. Let's just intermingle with it. Let's just learn to live with it. But Daniel was not that kind of a man, a young man. He, in spite of his own, he was taken into captivity even though it was not his carelessness that caused this. He was young. A young man who we assume had a love for God in his heart even from the days of his youth. But nevertheless, because of the casualness and carelessness of those who were supposed to spiritually lead the people, he found himself swallowed by this nation called Babylon, which is a type of, of the spirit of this world. And Daniel was taken into the king's palace. He was made a eunuch in the king's palace, which meant technically he would never have a family. And the tragedy of it all, because everything to this young boy about Jewishness is about having a family. It's all about heritage, lineage, sons, daughters, and home. And all that was taken away from him. He would have all the reason in the world, as many would in our generation, to be bitter. There are some young people today who say, look, I'm not responsible for this mess. And I am, I am handicapped in a measure because of it now. My opportunities are gone. My family's been destroyed. Uh, I, I don't have the opportunities for college and such like that I would like to have had. Our economy's in distress. And there's ample reasons to be better. There's ample reasons to compromise and say, well, I'm just going to find happiness where I can find it. In this new dominant culture that's come in, basically saying you will do it our way. We're, we have, we're surrounding you. We're going to dictate how things are going to be done, how you're going to worship God. We're going to bring you into our court. And it's all going to be done our way. But Daniel purposed that he would not defile himself. And in chapter 5 and verse 12, the testimony of this young man was an excellent spirit was given him. He was given knowledge, understanding, the ability to interpret dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas. It, it, really, in the, in the original text, it means untying knots, difficult situations, things that were hard to understand. Daniel was given this power by God. And through, though the people of God were captivated, God's name was still brought to honor through this young man, Daniel, and those who were like him. Now, I want to challenge you today, young people that are here. There's a tremendous opportunity, no matter how dark you may think the days are, there's a tremendous opportunity for you to bring glory to God. God is willing to be God in you, and he's willing to do what only he can do. When all else fails, turn to him with all your heart, as Daniel did. And in chapter 2, verses 47 to 49, <clears throat> Scripture says, The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal the secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these are friends of Daniel's, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Again, in Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 19, it tells us that Daniel knew that wisdom, which shines light into darkness, comes from God. Listen to his prayer. It says, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Oh, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. 
and now have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the king's demand. Daniel understood mysteries. He saw the rise and fall of human kingdoms on the earth and knew that all of them were predestined by God for a certain period of time. And he described these kingdoms with incredible accuracy. Kingdoms which have been without any doubt verified by the testimony now of history itself. He stood before Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon at that time who had a dream that troubled him. And Daniel was given by God the interpretation of this dream and as he stood before the king. And he basically told this king, God appointed you, God established you, but there's a day coming when your kingdom is going to be over. And another kingdom, Medo-Persia, under the leadership of Cyrus, is going to overthrow you. And even after that kingdom, there's going to be another one called the kingdom of the Greeks under Alexander the Great, which is going to come and have its moment shining in the sun as it is in history. And then after Alexander the Great, another kingdom is going to rise that we know today to be Rome. He called it a kingdom of iron, a kingdom that was going to trample everything in its path and rule by force and might and be bound together by this common bond of dominating the world. Then Daniel saw right into our day, a time when the remnants of this Roman Empire would be gathered together into a, a collection of nations. We know it today to be the European Union. Out of the old Roman Empire, they would come back together, but they would not have the strength of this original kingdom. They would not adhere to one another. In other words, they would call themselves by a common name, but they would retain their collective and individual identities. And there would always be this faction wanting to break away, come back together, break away. And we actually see the words of Daniel being fulfilled in our generation. It's an incredible thing when you look at it. God gave him a, a collective view right down to our day and something just to come. Because in chapter two, verse 44, speaking about this, this final kingdom that was going to arise in that part of the world that God had spoken to him about, he said, and in the days of these kings, and I believe that, you can research it yourself, but I believe it to be the revived European Union that we're seeing now in our generation. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. In other words, there will not be another kingdom after this present one. It will be the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God. It will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it will stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Folks, you've got to understand something and let it go down deep into your heart. We are living in the days of Christ's return. I don't know. I don't know how many years that's going to be. No, no one knows. But the Bible does tell us that we are not children of darkness, that this day should overtake us as a thief. In the final book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, the final chapter, verses nine and 10, he tells us in the final days of humankind that many will turn to God and be changed by him and they'll be given understanding of the time that they're living in. Verse nine says, and he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked will do wickedly. And none of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. Amen. None of the wicked will know where we're headed. That's always the way it's been. None of the wicked knew in the days of Noah. They ate and drank, married, gave in marriage, there was a testimony, there was a witness, there was a call of God going out into the society of that time. Turn from your sin, turn to God. There has been an ark of safety prepared, but they chose to ignore it. They had no idea what was coming their way. You see this collectively all throughout history. These kingdoms, even though the word of God clearly prophesied to these kingdoms, Belshazzar, the descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, before whom Daniel initially gave this word, took the holy things 
of the temple in Jerusalem and with his lords and his wives and his concubines threw a party and began to drink out of the holy things of God, began to become intoxicated technically on that which belonged to the temple of God and was set apart for its use. And that's when Daniel again was called in because a hand appeared and began to write on the wall and nobody understood it. And Belshazzar's knees began to knock together so violently that it says even the, the joints of his thighs became loosed. He was so afraid of what he saw. They called Daniel in and Daniel said, you knew Belshazzar that God is the one who sets up kings and takes them down. You knew that kingdoms and nations were in the hand of God for God took your predecessor Nebuchadnezzar in his pride and sent him out into a field like a madman until he bent his hand, his heart and his knee to God and recognized that it is God who rules in the heavens and the earth. And this history was not hidden from you, but you chose to party with the holy things of God. And finally, your kingdom has come to the point now which I spoke to your predecessor about. It's come to the point now where the Medes and the Persians are gonna take over. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Every earthly kingdom has an appointed time and a time when it begins and a time when it ends. No earthly kingdom lasts forever, none. Europe, Rome didn't last forever. Alexander the Great, no, he was a, a conqueror, they say, that was given supernatural power, not necessarily of God, but to do what he did. But he died young and his kingdom was split as is written by one of the other prophets among his four generals. Oh folks, God preordains everything on the earth. There's nothing out of his control. Everything is in his hand. He knows, he has all knowledge. Even when God's people, even before God's people were taken into captivity, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and told him there was going to be a season of captivity in Babylon and a king called Cyrus was going to be raised up from the Medo-Persian empire who was going to issue a decree and let the people of God go home. This is dozens and dozens and dozens of years before Cyrus is even born. God knows his name. God knows he's going to write a decree. God knows he's going to send him home. There is knowledge in God. There's knowledge for those who make right choices. There's wisdom to understand our times. There's, there's power to live in a way that can glorify the name of God, but it does require something on our part. We're living in an hour where none of the wicked understand. This world is hell bent on hell itself. It's not going to be turned by and large from its course of action. But God has a people. The scripture says that we shine like stars. We're appointed of God as a demonstration of seasons and times and a signpost for those who want to find their way into a place of safety and into a place where God is. And I believe, as God said to Daniel, the words will be closed up until the time of the end. Many will be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked will do wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. Oh God, that should be the cry of your heart and mine now. Oh Jesus, give me understanding. Give me wisdom, unlock the text of scripture. Show me where we're headed. Show me how I fit. Show me what my life can become. Because the scripture says that I'm not a child of darkness. These days are not to overpower me like a thief. I'm not to be caught running around terrified like everybody else, wringing my hands, pointing my finger, blaming others for the misery that's come upon me. Daniel could easily have done that. And you and I would look and see, he would be rightly justified, and I'm sure many did. Daniel could have sat down at the table of the king, anointed himself with the finest of oils. He could have drank wine to get rid of his sense of despair. He could have eaten of the finest delicacies of that society but he made a right choice because he was not a child of darkness. He was a child of light and thank God he did because he did. I most believe that it was the influence of Daniel on King Cyrus that caused him eventually to issue the decree to let the Jewish people go back to their homeland and rebuild the temple that Jesus Christ eventually himself in human form came and walked into. Oh, God's ways are so beyond our ways, my brother, my sister, God's 
strength and thoughts are so beyond our thoughts. We live in mediocrity if we choose just to walk by our own human reasoning and we neglect to lay hold of what God has for us in this time. Listen to what Paul says to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll just read it to you, beginning at verse 1. Concerning the times of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they, sh- they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. This day should not overtake us as a thief. Oh, thank God for that knowledge to you and I. We're not children of darkness. We're not called to live in darkness. We're called to live and walk in the light and we're called to be the light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden. I believe there are giftings of God, empowerments of God, offices of God, callings of God. If you and I have the courage to do what Daniel did and stand up and say, I choose rather to be counted in with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I choose, I make a willful choice in my heart that I'm going to separate myself from that which is bringing dullness into this generation. I'm going to separate myself from the evil speech. I'm going to separate myself from all of the division, the anger, all of the indulgences, all the things that people are using to bring themselves temporary measures of peace in the heart. I'm going to separate myself from these things. I don't, Daniel could have said, I don't know what the future holds, but I know in my heart that God holds the future. And so I'm going with the one who holds the future. Let Babylon, Babylon all at once about all of its wondrousness and all of its vineyards and all of its gardens and all of its might and all of its power and all of its society and all of its new imagery of what society should look like. Let Babylon build its golden images of itself, play its music and command the people to bow before it. Let Babylon surround the testimony of God and virtually demand that the people of God acquiesce to that which we know is not right. Let Babylon do all of these things. But I know that Babylon has an end. I know that every kingdom of this world comes to an end. I know that nothing of flesh can exalt itself in the sight of a holy God. I know just as the early church prayed in Acts chapter 4 when they were being threatened about the testimony of Christ. Lord, you are God. You are God who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why do the heathen rage and the kings of the earth imagine a vain thing? Behold, the kings of the earth and even religious compromisers join with them against the testimony of God and against his Christ. And then they said, but only to do what your hand has predetermined before that should be done. In other words, they're not allowed outside of the boundaries that you have set for them. You allow them to exist for a moment. And as the scripture says, we're here for a moment like a vapor on a cold day that comes out of a person who's exhaling. We're visible just for a moment and then we're gone. It's the same with kings, it's the same with kingdoms. There's only one kingdom that's going to last. There's only one king that's going to reign forever. And you and I have to make a choice. Which kingdom are we going to let influence us? Which kingdom is going to offer us our solace in times of sorrow? Which kingdom is going to dictate to us our value system for the future. Which kingdom are we going to serve? Are we going to kowtow down to leaders who erect statues in their own image and command that everyone bend to it? Or are we going to stand as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did and say, if God wants to, he can deliver us. But if not, we will not bend before this image you set before us. I'm sure there was a lot of scriptural people in that generation, a lot of people that 
study this text, the scrolls who believed in God, but their names are not mentioned anywhere in scripture or in history. The only names that are mentioned are the names that God used to make a difference, to honor his name, to speak for him, to stand for him, to declare what is right in the midst of what is wrong without fear and without compromise, even to face the lion's den as Daniel did near the end of his days. Oh, thank God that he didn't bend his knee to the society around him, but he stayed true to his God. Daniel chapter 12 and verse three talks about a day that we're going to face in the not too distant future. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. God says there's an eternal reward ahead of us for those who make the choice to stand true and to stand strong for what they know is right. That we will shine forever, for eternity, like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Those who make right choices will not only be a testimony in time, but you will be a testimony for eternity. It all depends now on what we choose to do with what we know. We're living in a time where darkness is trying to captivate the testimony of Christ. We're living in a time when evil is becoming good and good is becoming evil. We're living in a time when anybody who stands for the truth of God is vilified and given derogatory names, out of touch, bigoted, unnecessary, a hindrance to society. We've even been called domestic terrorists. I'm not kidding you folks. These are dark times, very, very dark times. You and I know that we serve a savior that tells us that we should love our enemies. You and I serve a savior that says we should do good to all men. You and I know that what we believe and what we walk in is right, it is true, it is just, it is holy. It is the only way to everlasting life. It is the only way that men and women can walk together in unity in such a divided time. Look at this church alone, 104 different nationalities worshiping God together. Where in the world could this ever happen? Nowhere but in the church of Jesus Christ. And so the question arises, how do I get light in a darkened time? Where does joy come from that will keep my heart glad and give me strength to face what I have to face? Where do I get the vision that God gave to Daniel that seems to be promised to those of us who live in these last and very, very dark times? Where do we find this wisdom? The wisdom that tells us this is the path before you walk in it. Where do we get this kind of wisdom? And how do we start doing this? Do we study more? Do we pray more? These things are good and we must do these things, but that's not the key in itself. The key is in verse eight of Daniel chapter one. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine that he drank. And therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. There are so many delicacies now being offered by this society, things to please the eye, things that claim that they will gladden the heart, things that offer reprieve or hope or gladness, things that are portraying themselves as right, even though in your heart you know they're wrong. They're delicacies, things on the internet, things on television, things on the radio, things that are being spoken, things that are in writing in magazines and booklets, delicacies that this fallen society is presenting to the church of Jesus Christ as an enticement. Sing here, partake of this. It will take away a bit of the pain. will make you happy for just a little while. And he refused to drink of the wine which the king drank. And that means anything that this society offers us which produces temporary relief, a sense of intoxicated joy, may I call it that. Anything that offers us comfort. I can see in Daniel's day, multitudes going in that direction, multitudes sitting at the king's table, multitudes drinking of the king's wine, multitudes just forsaking their value system and their identity. They knew instinctively what was right. They'd been taught many from their youth and what was wrong. And it would be so sad for a young men like Daniel and his friends to see those who are older in the faith, 
who were supposed to have been the teachers in the synagogue, to see them compromise, to see them bend, to see them lose their influence, their authority, and even the tragedy of watching them bow before the golden statue of that era in which they were forced to live. When a wicked culture tries to take over and swallow up the church of Jesus Christ, I speak to you like Mordecai spoke to Esther. Don't think you're going to find some safe place to hunker down and ride out the storm. Don't think you'll escape there. The only true respite that you and I are going to find is we make the choice as Daniel did and say, I'm not going to defile myself with what this world feeds on. I'm not, I'm not going on the internet for my solace. I'm not going to listen to the radio for it. I'm not going into clubs to get it. I'm not going with the ungodly to find it. I'm going to get away from the ungodly. I'm getting out of the seat of the scornful. I'm going to trust that God will plant me by a river of living water. I'm going to believe, as the scripture says, that God will plant me beside a river of living water. And the rains will come and the winds will blow. But I will not be moved by the adversities that we're going to face in this hour in which we live. And as the scripture says... I will, if I'm planted in the courts of God, I will still bear fruit in old age. Nothing will change, no matter how, I, my body may weaken, but I'm not trusting in the natural strength of my own heart or my own reasoning. I'm trusting in the power of the Holy One who dwells within me by His Holy Spirit. I'm trusting in His life within mine, and I believe that I will still bear fruit in old age. You and I have to make the choice now. God, I'm going to turn away from what is wrong and I'm going to turn to what is right simply because I know in my heart this is the right thing to do. I see where the delicacies of this society are leading it. Families are breaking down. Government is paralyzed. Statesmanship is gone. Lies are propagated as truth. There's no integrity. There's no honesty. There's nothing anymore. Society is collapsing all around us. Our economy is going to soon be in tatters. We're living in a time when this kingdom's about to come to its finish. But I'm telling you, by God's grace, there will be a Daniel. By God's grace, there will be young men. By God's grace, there will be young women. By God's grace, there will be voices that will be raised up of God. Not empowered by men, but empowered by God. Not standing, as the Bible says, with fleshly wisdom garnered by all the efforts of man, but standing with divine revelation given by God. It doesn't mean we're coming up with something new. It means we're speaking what's already written with power, making it visible, making it manifest, making it understood. Standing as Daniel did saying, men's kingdoms don't last. Only the kingdom of God is the one that's eternal. And no matter what people are saying and will be saying about religion in the coming days, make it, let it be very clear. There's only one name given under heaven whereby men might be saved. There's no duplicity of names. There's only one door. There's only one path. There's only one way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no man, no man comes to the Father but by me. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The day has come upon you and I when we're going to have to stand before rulers. We're going to have to stand before bosses. We're going to have to stand in courtrooms, perhaps, even in the days ahead. And we're going to simply have to stand with the testimony of God in our heart, the word of God in our mouth, the light of God in our eyes. We're going to stand on behalf of the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no life. There is no lasting kingdom. There is no power apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. May God help us in these days in which we're living. May God help us to soberly assess where we are, as Daniel must have. And he must have spoken with his friends and said, listen, we either go with Babylon or we go with God. If we go with God, we don't know where it's going to lead us. But if we go with Babylon, we know where that's going to go. We're going to lose our heritage. We're going to lose our song. We're going to lose our testimony. We're going to lose the power of our lives. We're going to lose touch with God. And is it worth it? Is it worth it to be defiled with the things of this world, the thinking of this world, the luxuries of this world? Is it worth it to lose the testimony of God? No, sir, it's not. No, sir, it's not. But Daniel purposed in his heart 
that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And here's where all this leads to. This is where it begins. Now Daniel requested of the chief of the eunuchs, but we have somebody with higher authority than that. We can come to God and say, Lord, I, I petition you that I, will, would, that I would have the power to turn away from that which will dull my soul, take away my vision. I petition you, God, for the strength. And some of you already know what you have to petition God for. You're at the wrong table, you're eating the wrong thing, and you're drinking the wrong thing, and you already know. It could be a relationship that you are, you're so tied into, but in your heart you know this, is, this other person belongs to Babylon, not the kingdom of God. And you know where this is going to take you. And the devil would have you believe, well, this is the love of your life, and your life is over, and it's wasted and miserable. You marry that girl, you marry that guy. You, if you think your life's over now, you wait till five, ten years from now. You wait till you have children. And Mr. Babylon doesn't want to bring them to this house. And the sorrow that comes into your heart was well, you watch the devil begin to just steamroll right over your house and your family. My brother, my sister, I, I plead with you. That's all I know how to do. You have to make the choice now. I don't know if next year will be too late for some. But you have to make the choice now. And the promise I read in the book of Daniel is that this book will unlock. The words of it will become clear. Things that are mysteries to you and the evil will never know them will become clear to your mind. You begin to see the cross. You begin to see the resurrection. You begin to understand the heart of God. You begin to see the way God works. You, your prayer life will take on a dimension you never ever believed it would. Faith will start to arise in your heart. And it will start to become the delight of your heart to stand for God. Even though in the natural it, it might be an unpleasant place to be. But you won't be living there. There'll be something going on in your heart. You'll be given a, a view into eternity. Suddenly you begin to realize this is not the only life we're going to live. We have an eternal life in us. This is only a temporary time. This is a world that is bent on eradicating itself of the testimony of Jesus Christ since the day of Eden. The Bible tells us clearly in the New Testament there's going to be a wholesale, unimaginable, lawless rebellion against God and the ways of God. And I happen to believe we are living in the beginnings of that time. It's going to get very, very dark. Very dark. Very quickly. Please, please make the choice. Daniel purposed in his heart. I will not defile myself. I will walk with God. Let that please be the cry of your heart. If you're walking in something that's, that you know today, you know in your heart that where I am is wrong, then please have the courage to just respond today and say, God, you know I can't get out. You know it's so interwoven itself into my character. You know I'm such a coward, but I don't want to be defiled. I, I want this vision that God promises to those who belong to him in the last days. I want to be able to see. And God will receive you and give you the strength to endure what you will have to endure. And then for others who just don't know, but say, God, please protect me. Please, God, keep me. I'm praying it now. Keep me from anything that would defile your testimony in my life, that would make me dull, would take away my sight, song and speech, that would cause me to not be a testimony for you. Oh, Jesus, please, God, as Daniel came to the prince of the eunuchs, please, God, I petition of you that you would keep me from defilement, that you would make it the delight of my life to 
to only partake of what God says I should. And you'd give me the, the heart to put away what God says I shouldn't partake of. I can't explain all of the things that this refers to, but you already know many what that is. We're going to stand in just a moment. We're going to worship for about 10 minutes. But if God's speaking to your heart here in the main sanctuary in the North Jersey campus, in the education annex, and at home, for those that are listening online, just get up, please, and move forward in your living room if you're at home towards the screen that you're watching, or just even stand to your feet. And we're going to pray together in just a few minutes. We're going to ask God to make us into the people of God. Help us. Help us, especially young people that are here now. God, help us to be a testimony for your name. As we stand together, if God's speaking to you, please just meet me at the front of this auditorium, if you will, and we'll pray together in just a moment. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We, had a, we have a radio program that's going out across the nation at uh, Easter time. And on that program, there's uh, a testimony of a young man in this church. And I loved his testimony when I heard it because he said, I was raised in the church and my mom used to pray for me. And uh, he was caught living in two worlds, coming to church, but living outside and having a whole other life that's interconnected with the ways of this fallen world around us. And he said, I, I had a sense in my heart that to go all the way with God is going to mean the end of my life. Like my life is over. It's finished. If I go all the way with God, all the fun's going to be gone. You know, the, everything I enjoy is going to be taken away. And he said, but I came to the conclusion for my family's sake that somebody's got to die that the rest may live. That's phenomenal. Only God could have shown him that. Somebody's got to die that my family may live. And he said, so I made the choice to go with God. And he said, was I ever wrong? He said, it was the beginning of my life. He said, I have, I have been places I've, I've been able to do things and I've had experiences in God. He said, it's, if I'd have known this earlier, that it was the beginning of life, not the end of anything. And so I look out at, at this altar. I know a lot of folks that are here. I know, as the, the Bible says, that we're not all here the strongest. We're not the wisest. We're, we don't have the, the, a track record of uh, all these exploits in God. But you are God's army for this end time. You are the testimony of God. It is amazing when you think of it. You look at scripture and, and, and study it and find out who, who does he take to show his power and his glory to a generation. He takes people who know they need God. He takes people who are not going to touch the glory because they know that every good thing that they will have to do and say has come from God himself. That will be the testimony. The scripture says that eventually all of you will shine like lights. You'll shine like stars. That's the eternal reward that God will give you. I don't know how that's going to look, but I know what it says. You'll shine like stars because you chose to shine here on this side of eternity. You chose to let the light and love of God. And so this is not the end of anything. This is the beginning of life. This is the beginning of a wondrous journey with God. Thank God. It's amazing how we, we mourn leaving death and embracing life. It should be the other way around. But that's just the way it is in this world. We, we actually mourn letting go of that which is killing us to embrace that which will give us life. But I make you a promise. It may not be, I know for sure when Daniel sat at that table day one, it didn't know where it was going to lead. But it eventually led to kings changing their mind about God. Laws were changed. And eventually a decree was written on letting the people of God go home with resources to rebuild the testimony of God in the earth. And it all started because one person made a choice. Just made a choice. I'm going to live for God. And I'm going to turn to that which gives me strength and I'm going to turn away from that which weakens me. Now, Father, I thank you, Lord, with all my heart, God, for these men and women here in the church sanctuary who've already made their minds up and here at the altar who are making their minds up. 
God Almighty, you're calling us, Lord, to be a testimony of you in this generation. And this is a walk of victory. Even though in the natural it may look hard, it is a walk of victory. God, David, the king said, many shall see this and turn from their wicked ways and begin to fear God. I thank you, Lord, that you will give us the strength to stand. You'll give us the words to speak. You'll give us the right spirit. It says of Daniel, he was a man with an excellent spirit. And so, Lord, you'll give us an excellent spirit. Not a people who simply argue, but who stand in truth and are themselves a presentation of truth. Father, we thank you, God, that you will allow us to be an embodiment of the heart that sent the Son of God to a cross. Lord, we don't want to be anything other than that. Give us the grace we need to turn away from that which weakens us and give us the courage to embrace that which will give us strength. Father, we thank you, God. I thank you for what will happen just from this altar call today, Lord. I thank you for this with all my heart. In Jesus' name, amen, amen and amen. Praise God.